Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the forum. And it's a terrific turnout. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Elaine K. Mark. I'm a faculty member here and a director of a program called Visions of Governance for the 21st Century. And it is my distinct honor tonight to welcome and to introduce Noam Chomsky. I think most of you here know a lot about Professor Chomsky. He is certainly one of this century's most important figures. The New York Times proclaimed, quote, judged in terms of power, range, novelty, and influence of his thought, Noam Chomsky is arguably the most important intellectual alive today. Now, on hearing this, Professor Chomsky, <laughs> ever careful, is always quick to point out the next sentence that reads, quote, since that's the case, how can he write such terrible things about American foreign policy? <laughs> Which I think it shows that he is a wonderful intellect and a wonderful human being. Um, I, we, of course, know that Mr. Chomsky is unquestionably one of the world's foremost linguists. The Washington Post has called him the patriarchal founder of modern linguistics, and his early work in the field has been dubbed the Chomskyan Revolution. His early work, beginning with his syntactic structures uh, published in 1957 and his theory of universal grammar, has been equated with Darwin's theory of evolution and Freud's theory of the unconscious in terms of its importance in the history of ideas. Over the years, his linguistic theories have been expanded into the fields of psychology, philosophy, and cognitive sciences. But as important as his work as a linguist is, of course, the reason that he is invited here tonight to the forum where we pride ourselves in having vivid and, and vigorous debate about ideas of our times is that Professor Chomsky has also had a very, very vibrant intellectual career in the public realm. In 1964, his response to the moral challenge of the Vietnam War turned him into one of the most politically engaged intellectuals of his generation. I was in college during the time when I first, and, and a, a anti-war demonstrator, and I remember we heard often about Mr. Chom Professor Chomsky's speeches, his writings, etc. Jack Peck, in the introduction to the Chomsky Reader, writes, in American history, no one's writings are more unsettling than Noam Chomsky's. He is among our greatest dissenters. No intellectual tradition quite captures his voice. Thinking within traditions is anathema to him. No party claims him. He is a spokesman for no ideology. Is it, an, it is an indication of the radical nature of his dissent that it fits nowhere. I think this is something that ma has made him one of the most intriguing intellectuals of our time. He has written and spoken critically and extensively about US foreign policy, intellectual conformity, media propaganda. Over his 70 books and hundreds of articles um, are Manufacturing Consent, Deterring Democracy, Necessary Illusions, Year 501, The Fateful Triangle, and Powers and Prospects. He has been awarded the 1988 Kyoto Prize, described as the Japanese equivalent of the Nobel Prize. And many of his works are available in an eight-volume collection just been published by Rutledge as part of its critical assessment series. Um, I, th I am privileged to meet a man that I have known about since I was a college student. And I see that we have many students and probably many members of the community here. I'd like you to give a warm welcome to Professor Noam Chomsky. Well, with regard to uh, sovereignty and world order, the title, uh, there are two questions that uh, arise at once. Uh, one is the question uh, that I'm sure is on everyone's mind at the moment, uh, the question of intervention, uh, forcible intervention in violation of sovereign rights. And the question is, when is it justified? Uh, and the other question is, uh, 
uh, has to do with ceding sovereignty to the international community. So when is that appropriate? Uh, and when is uh, refusal to do so justified? Uh, these two issues, which interrelate, have a long history. Uh, they took a decisive turn uh, about 50 years ago at the end of the Second World War uh, when a new international regime was established, uh, primarily under U.S. initiative, a reflection of overwhelming U.S. power that was, had been nothing like it in history. Uh, that new regime uh, had a number of components. There was a, a human rights regime articulated in the Universal Declaration, uh, an international political order, which is the one I mainly want to talk about, uh, articulated in the UN Charter, and an international economic order uh, developed at the Bretton Woods Conference, sometimes called the Bretton Woods System. Uh, these three were related, uh, closely interrelated. It's uh, maybe less known, though it should be known, uh, in the case of the Bretton Woods system, but a, a primary element of it was motivated by concerns over sovereignty and human rights over the other two issues. Uh, the Bretton Woods system was based, um, as I'm sure you know, on regulation of capital. Uh, a large part of the reason for that was the understanding of the framers of Bretton Woods that capital mobility is a weapon, a powerful weapon, in fact, against sovereignty hence against democracy to the extent that the polity is democratic, uh, and also against human rights, uh, specifically against the socioeconomic rights that are a core element of the uh, Universal Declaration, and that were particularly significant because of the situation at the end of the Second World War when they were very strongly supported. Uh, it was a, uh, and uh, the idea is, the point is more or less obvious, explicit in, uh, in Bretton Woods planning, uh, and uh, discussed reasonably well in uh, standard economic histories. So Barry Eichengreen, in a recent history of the international economic system, points out succinctly uh, the main point. Uh, he says, as many others have pointed out as well, that by gross measures, the level of globalization today is more or less like what it was before the First World War. It's returning something like the pre-World War I level, but with crucial differences. And the crucial difference that he emphasizes, this is in history of the international financial system, the crucial uh, difference that he stresses is that uh, at that time, pre-World War I, it's mostly quotes, uh, economic policy making had not yet been politicized by universal male suffrage and the rise of trade unionism and par uh, parliamentary labor parties. In other words, there wasn't much in the way of democracy. Uh, so therefore, the costs of uh, financial rectitude, uh, meaning making sure that investors and creditors are happy, uh, those costs uh, could be transferred to the general population, who didn't have much of a voice. Uh, but by World War II, things had changed. Uh, there had been an expansion of democracy, and there was a new and strong focus on human rights. Uh, as a result, he says, the Bretton Woods system imposed limits on capital mobility uh, as a substitute for limits on democracy uh, as a source of insulation from market pressures. Again, market pressures is that code word I already described. Uh, there's, of course, a, that's, a, I think, a fair assessment of the thinking uh, and what happened, but it, it does have a corollary. Uh, the corollary is, is that the dismantling of the Bretton Woods system since the early 1970s, uh, you would expect it to be, and indeed it has been, accompanied by uh, a strong assault against uh, functioning democracy, democracy apart from forms, uh, and sovereignty, that is, uh, popular sovereignty, and also against human rights, specifically against the socioeconomic uh, provisions of the Universal Declaration. In fact, that's a good part of the history of the past 25 years. Uh, and looking at it closely shows the interrelations of these things. Well, there's a lot to say about that, but come back to it if you like. But I'll drop th that topic, though it's a crucial and central one, uh, and uh, uh, has 
rather interesting things have happened just in the last couple of weeks relating to it in countries as different as uh, Germany and Brazil. Uh, but I'll put it aside and turn to a narrower question, uh, the question of uh, the international political order. Uh, and uh, again, the two issues of sovereignty. So what about the right of intervention, uh, which violates sovereignty? And what about the willingness to relinquish sovereignty? Uh, that is, to take part in a, uh, an international community, to submit to an international regime of world order. Uh, there is a truism, which I won't waste much time on, uh, unless the most powerful uh, are willing to accept uh, the rules of world order, that is, to uh, uh, subordinate a degree of sovereignty to uh, international law and international order. Unless that's true, the system is plainly a farce. Uh, it's nothing more than a weapon to use against, uh, against the weak. That ought to be a truism. Uh, now, these two issues, the, uh, uh, these two aspects of the question of sovereignty and world order, they are related. Uh, they're the simplest way to perceive a relationship is to recognize another truism, namely insofar as intervention violating sovereignty might be legitimate, uh, the judgment that it is is based on judgments of good faith <clears throat> on the part of those who are intervening uh, to violate sovereignty. And a crucial element of good faith, crucial evidence for it, is precisely the willingness to accept the rules of world order yourself that is to relinquish sovereignty uh, under um, the regime of international law and international order. So the two points are quite closely related, just on essentially logical grounds. Well, that much is obvious, and it's also familiar. Uh, you can, uh, so take, say, the, uh, the, the, rec the most recent uh, extensive scholarly study of humanitarian intervention, which is a kind of a hot topic in the last couple of years. Uh, this is a book came out a year or two ago by Sean Murphy, who's now the counselor for legal affairs in the US Embassy in The Hague. Uh, and he looks at both the legal and historical aspects of humanitarian intervention. It's actually a PhD thesis turned into a book, so very scholarly. Uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the period right before the New World Order, that is right before the UN Charter, so in particular the period in between the kellogg briand uh, Pact of 1928, which banned the use of force, and the UN Charter, which spelled that out much more explicitly. In that period, he points out that there were examples of uh, uh, what was put forth as humanitarian intervention. Uh, he finds three major examples of states that articulated the right of humanitarian intervention. Uh, one was Japan and Manchuria. The second was Italy in Ethiopia, and the third was Germany in Czechoslovakia. Well, no need to comment much about it. Uh, they all, if you look at the, at, the, at the declarations and pronouncements, presumably as sincere as anyone else's, uh, they just exude uh, humanitarian rhetoric, uh, and they're full of talk about self-defense, so quite impressive. Uh, as I say, there's no need to comment about the examples, um, though we might ask uh, how they compare with the post-UN uh, uh, Charter interventions. Um, that's a fair question. Don't advise you to write a thesis on it. Uh, but it is a fair question, and it has interesting answers when you pursue it, if you want my opinion. I've written about some of the cases comparing them. Well. That brings out the obvious fact that uh, unless uh, there is good faith uh, as illustrated by a willingness to accept the rules of world order, uh, you can't take very seriously any claims about humanitarian intervention, even when they have a degree of force, as in fact, if you look, as in the case of all propaganda, they did in these cases. Uh, well, let's take a more recent case, uh, very recent, Bosnia. Uh, during the period of the worst atrocities in Bosnia early, a couple of years ago, uh, no one was willing to intervene by force. And that reluctance uh, elicited uh, very strong criticism, huge torrent of criticism. Uh, however, there was one fact that was kind of generally more or less overlooked or not mentioned at all. Uh, namely, it seemed that there was one country that was willing to intervene to protect the Bosnians. 
uh, from the slaughter that was going on, and it might well have been able to do so, uh, namely Iran. Uh, well, that could have been feasible. Maybe the U.S. could have provided them some logistic help, you know, a couple of C-130s or something. Uh, but uh, uh, we don't, uh, that was not an option. I mean, nobody considered that possibility. If anybody had bothered to mention it, it would have been ridiculed. Uh, in fact, uh, Iranian support for uh, uh, Bosnia, uh, supply of arms, uh, advisors, volunteers, uh, that when it was detected, that was considered a very serious charge against Bosnia and against Iran. Uh, and we have to ask why, you know. Uh, well, one obvious answer is there's no presumption of good faith. Uh, fair enough. Uh, I don't presume it either. Uh, but there is an obvious question. Uh, is Iran's record on intervention, how does Iran's record on intervention compare with those who did intervene, say, with the United States? Well, fair question, uh, not asked. Uh, but these questions are plainly worth asking, and everywhere you look, those questions arise. Uh, well, they're not asked. In fact, they're unthinkable. Uh, when they are mentioned, they tend to elicit tantrums. Uh, for example, uh, on the part of one of the leading academic specialists on humanitarian intervention, Thomas Weiss, uh, his reaction to this question is that it's just uh, sound bites and invectives about Washington's historically evil foreign policy. So we can therefore forget about the question. Uh, or we can turn to Henry Kissinger, who explains why there's no issue. Uh, writing a couple of weeks ago, he points out that the Balkan conflicts over many centuries are fought with such uh, unparalleled ferocity uh, because the people there lack Western concepts of tolerance. Uh, so there's plainly no issue about Western intervention because uh, no question of good faith in the light of the history of Europe uh, 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 internally where people, French and British and Germans treated each other with such loving solicitude over many centuries uh, and, and acted the same way with, in the rest of the world uh, instead of uh, showing the unparalleled ferocity that you find in these savage areas. Well, given that history, uh, there's no question of good faith that arises if the West uh, intervenes uh, in the Balkans, so we can get rid of the question that way. Well, if we decide to be serious about the issues, uh, departing from convention, uh, then a lot of questions arise. Uh, so we might look at some of the cases that might qualify as humanitarian intervention. Uh, good place to start. Uh, maybe the most obvious is the Vietnamese invasion of Cambodia, 1979, uh, which terminated uh, the Pol Pot atrocities, which were, happened to be peaking right at that time. Uh, the worst atrocities were in, it's now known, were in 78, probably late 78, just at the time of the intervention, which was in December 1979, the 78, uh, and that terminated them. Uh, well, what was the reaction to the Vietnamese intervention to terminate the Pol Pot slaughters as they were peaking? Uh, the reaction was bitter condemnation of what the New York Times called the Prussians of Asia. Uh, there was an immediate Chinese invasion to teach them a lesson, which the U.S. strongly supported. Uh, the United States recognized the democratic Kampuchea at the United Nations officially because of its continuity, that was the word that was used, because of its continuity with the Khmer Rouge regime. Uh, Vietnam, uh, the U.S. also gave military aid right away to Pol Pot, a little bit indirectly, but not very subtly. Uh, the uh, Vietnam was severely punished for this crime. Uh, was, uh, harsh sanctions were imposed. Uh, that was for the crime of ousting Pol Pot and terminating his massacres, uh, invading in violation of international law, which bars the use of force in international affairs except in self-defense, as was grandly proclaimed. Uh, in fact, this is one of the few cases, maybe the only, it's hard to think of another one, maybe the best case, if not the only case, where a self-defense justification for intervention was actually warranted. Uh, uh, the Khmer Rouge, uh, Cambodia was carrying out murderous attacks in Vietnam along the border. Uh, so maybe you could justify it, maybe not. Uh, but in any event, that was certainly not the reaction. Well, that's probably the clearest case in the post-war period of an intervention, post-Second World, World War period, of an intervention uh, in self-defense, plausibly in self-defense, 
uh, and with uh, humanitarian consequences, in fact, very important humanitarian consequences, if not humanitarian intent, and it's kind of interesting to investigate uh, the reaction, uh, what happened uh, in response to this. Well, if you want to be serious about the question of humanitarian intervention and how it's understood in the West, uh, that's a, another good example to look at. Well, every one, every such example, this one or any other one, uh, has to be looked at closely. I mean, you have to look at it carefully. A few phrases don't suffice. Uh, but they, it does, all of these do raise obvious questions. They raise questions about the legitimacy of humanitarian intervention, about the question of good faith, about the record of those who are exercising the use of force. In particular, it, they raise questions about uh, their record uh, in accepting uh, an international regime of world order and therefore ceding sovereignty. Uh, just as in the case of intervention, they are compelling someone to cede sovereignty uh, because ceding sovereignty is what it means to participate in a community, no matter what it is, whether it's a family or international affairs, uh, participation in a community involves ceding a degree of what we call sovereignty in international affairs. Well, the regime of international order is pretty clear as these things go. Uh, the UN Charter strictly bans the threat or use of force, except in explicit circumstances. Uh, if explicitly uh, ordered by the Security Council, after the Security Council has determined that uh, all peaceful means have failed, or under the famous Article 51, uh, which permits self-defense against armed attack, uh, until the Security Council acts. Uh, armed attack is a narrow notion in international law. Well, the Charter isn't an axiom system for arithmetic, so the rules are not entirely precise, although they're reasonably clear. And they're also not moral absolutes. Uh, that is, you can, they're not inviolable. You can imagine circumstances in which maybe they should be violated. Uh, but there is a burden of proof. Uh, how heavy that the burden of proof is on anyone who violates them. Uh, how heavy that burden of proof is, is a value judgment. So for example, if you think it was fine for, say, Saddam Hussein to invade Kuwait, there's no burden of proof. Uh, on the other hand, if you think there was something wrong with that, uh, then there is a burden of proof uh, on uh, 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 any move to use force uh, in violation of uh, the charter and reasonable principles. Uh, well, beyond that, there's at least attention, if not an outright contradiction, uh, between the Charter and another one of the pillars of world order, namely the Universal Declaration. And it's that tension that opens up the question of humanitarian intervention. Uh, there are opinions about this by distinguished authorities who've taken strong, expressed strong views on the matter. Uh, one, the most important one, is the International Court of Justice. In the case of Nicaragua versus the United States, uh, the court took up this issue. The U.S. had not claimed the right of humanitarian intervention, uh, but the court discussed it anyway and ruled strongly on the matter, saying there is no such right. Uh, specifically, the court ruled on a question that was indeed applicable, the question of humanitarian aid, uh, and it gave an explicit, unambiguous determination that all U.S. aid to the Contras is military aid, including Band-Aids. Uh, none of it qualifies as humanitarian aid. That is a clear, explicit judgment of the, of the court. Well, that judgment was, that decision was dismissed. In fact, I don't even think it was ever reported. Uh, the military aid was called humanitarian aid. It was called that to the end until the U.S. had won that war. Uh, the, uh, um, in fact, the court decision altogether was dismissed. It was barely reported. Uh, the court was condemned uh, as having discredited itself by uh, ruling against the United States on this issue. Uh, it was denounced as a hostile forum uh, by the press. Uh, it was uh, condemned as being under the influence of the Russians by a research associate here. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> the Russians had uh, 
didn't take the Russian judge didn't take part in the court judgment, but that didn't matter. Uh, the uh, uh, but that there is at least one distinguished authority that has a position on the matter of uh, humanitarian intervention and humanitarian aid. Well, turning to scholarship, there are also our forthright positions that have been articulated by leading figures. Uh, for example, Headley Bull, uh, who writes in a that particular states or groups of states that, sets, that set themselves up as the authoritative judges of the common world good in disregard of the views of others are in fact a menace to international order and thus to effective action in the field. Or to take another distinguished commentator, Lewis Hankin, he says pressures in a standard work in this case, he says pressures eroding the prohibition on the use of force are deplorable and the arguments to legitimize the use of force in the case of human rights violations are unpersuasive and dangerous and would destroy any form of world order. He goes on, human rights, I believe, will have to be vindicated and other injustices remedied by other peaceful means, not by opening the door to aggression and destroying the principal advance in international law, the outlawing of war, the prohibition of the use of force. He's referring primarily to the Charter. As most of you are aware, these are not exotic examples. These are uh, the most, among the most prominent and respected uh, figures in the field of international affairs and international legal scholarship. Well, uh, these judgments, and there are plenty of them, uh, including the judgment of the World Court, uh, they don't resolve all the issues by any means. Uh, each case has to be examined on its own merits, and it has to be examined closely and judiciously. And it's worth, you have to look carefully at the reasons that are offered, at the justifications that are given, and at the record of those who are initiating the use of force. That's true whoever it is, whether it's the fascist countries before World War II, or uh, Vietnam, or Iran, uh, or uh, the United States. Same questions. Uh, one crucial element of that evaluation is, again, the second aspect of the question of sovereignty and world order, uh, that is, the willingness to accept the rules, uh, the willingness to uh, cede a degree of sovereignty uh, to uh, an international regime. Uh, well, uh, let's take some recent cases and see what happens if we look at those questions. So take the uh, U.S. bombing of uh, the Sudan last August, killing civilians, uh, destroying about half of the uh, pharmaceutical production in a poor African country. Well, it was blatantly illegal. I don't think anyone even tried to argue that it was consistent with uh, international law uh, the, uh, or the charter. Uh, it's now described as a mistake, you know, like maybe it wasn't what they thought it was. So we forget about it. Uh, if uh, uh, half of US pharmaceutical production was destroyed by, say, Islamic terrorists, uh, and then they said, oh, gee, sorry, I thought I was aiming at something else, uh, <laughs> it uh, probably would not be considered quite that lightly. You can run that thought experiment yourself. Uh, but in this case, uh, we know the reaction, and there's no need to comment on it. It tells you something about the respect for uh, international law, and human rights, uh, and the record on the part of those who claim the uh, authority uh, by virtue of their record for humanitarian intervention. Now, let's take another case, uh, the U.S.-British bombing of Iraq last December. Uh, that was discussed. Uh, it was a clear violation of the U.N. Charter and international law. Uh, the, that's denied, but uh, you can't, even the most tortured legal argument can't overcome the facts in this case, though it's been tried. Uh, the, even the timing uh, was, a, was an expression of contempt, actually brazen contempt uh, for the uh, charter. Uh, the bombing was timed to take to coincide with a session called by the Security Council for consideration of the, uh, of, uh, of the issue, uh, the, the problem that was arising. That's the moment that Washington selected, surely, purposely, uh, to illustrate its contempt for the, uh, uh, for the Security Council, uh, which had not been notified, of course. Uh, the uh, U.S. did have an official position, uh, stated, for example, by Secretary of Defense William Cohen, uh, who said, 
Uh, we prefer to act through allies, uh, but we will act unilaterally if necessary. Notice that we do not even prefer to act through the Security Council, uh, as required by solemn treaties, uh, international law, and so on. Nothing especially novel about that. Uh, Secretary of State Albright, when she was UN ambassador, had informed the Security Council that uh, the United States will act multilaterally when we can and unilaterally when we must uh, in areas that involve our interests. This in specifically specific issue then was Iraq and the unwillingness of the Security Council to go along with uh, U.S. forceful initiatives. Well, there were reasons provided in this case for the bombing. Uh, the main reason, repeated over and over again, was that Saddam Hussein was such a monster, which is certainly true. Uh, he had even committed the ultimate atrocity. Uh, he had used gas uh, in warfare and even against his own population. Uh, and therefore, how could we let him survive? We have to bomb no matter what international law says. Only problem with that is that it couldn't conceivably be the reason, since while it's all true, uh, he did it with strong U.S. support, uh, and that support furthermore continued uh, right through the period of the ultimate atrocity and in fact increased. Uh, so we know at once that that wasn't the reason. Uh, the other reason that was, the other second reason that was offered was that he was creating weapons of mass destruction. We couldn't let that go on. Although apparently it was all right not only to let it go on, but to help him construct weapons of mass destruction during the period when he was far more dangerous than he is today, uh, namely in the 1980s when he was a favored U.S. ally and trading partner while he was carrying out all of his worst atrocities. So then it was okay to let him, in fact, even to help him create weapons of mass destruction. Uh, now it's not. Uh, there was indeed a barrier to his creation of weapons of mass destruction, namely the inspection system, UNSCOM, imperfect but effective and by all, by common agreement, far more effective than bombing was. Uh, but it's kind of academic because the Pentagon announced in advance of the bombing that one of it, that its likely effect and the effect that it has indeed had uh, would be to terminate the inspections. That's the one thing that was putting some limits on the uh, creation of weapons of mass destruction, now terminated by the bombing. Uh, the UNSCOM, as is well known by now, had already been undermined uh, by U.S. subversion, uh, which essentially rendered it inoperative and has the further effect of uh, probably undermining inspection of uh, uh, nuclear proliferation as well. Uh, so that second reason can't conceivably have been the, the reason. And if you look more closely, it just becomes more obvious. I won't spend any more time on it except to point out that the reasons were plainly fraudulent on the most elementary inspection. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, they were repeated uh, vociferously and uncritically. Well, that tells us some lessons too. In this case, lessons about the intellectual culture. You might ask whether that degree of subordination and obedience to obviously ludicrous propaganda could be mimicked in a totalitarian state. Uh, another question to think about. Uh, but uh, let me put that aside. Uh, there are some other lessons, but I want to maybe I'll get back to them, but talk about some other things. Well, let's take a look, further look at the questions that uh, we would immediately raise with regard to anyone else. Uh, say, again, pre-war, pre-World War II fascist governments, Vietnam and Cambodia, uh, China and Tibet, Russia and Afghanistan, uh, Vietnam and Cam uh, Vietnam I mentioned, other similar cases, all cases of claimed humanitarian intervention and self-defense. Uh, well, the questions we would ask always uh, are the, uh, have to do with the nature of those who are intervening and their reasons. Uh, so what is their record of action? That's by far the most co important question. Uh, what's their record of doctrine? Uh, what, in fact, uh, is their record with regard to ceding sovereignty in the world community in accord with, the, with international law, the charter, world court, and so on? Well, the most important question is action, uh, by far. Uh, and there's a lot to say about it, but there isn't a lot of time. Uh, so I'll skip the most important question, come back, if you like, to some rather dramatic cases that are very relevant to today's headlines. Uh, but let me just make it obvious that that's the important question. What is the actual record of intervention? Let's take a look at the question of doctrine. 
Uh, I'm not talking about the world dominant power, by far the most important one, uh, and the one that does initiate the interventions that are supposed to be legitimate. Uh, well, the doctrinal record uh, illustrates, uh, it, it, what it reveals is that the contempt for international law, which is by now very uh, obvious and very brazen, I gave a couple of examples, uh, that's not novel. Uh, it is simply more brazen and open. Uh, and that has been the major innovation since the Reagan years that what was doctrine all along just became public doctrine uh, since Reagan and Clinton. Uh, and, uh, it, and it's quite interesting to look at the reasons that were given uh, to, for making public the total contempt for uh, the international order and international law. So take a look, for example, a crucial case is uh, when the U.S. Uh, withdrew its uh, acceptance of compulsory arbitration by the World Court. And there was an official explanation. Here it is, State Department legal advisor Abraham Sofair, uh, State Department bulletin in December 1985. Uh, he, point, he explains why the U.S. cannot accept World Court jurisdiction. He says, when the U.S. accepted such jurisdiction in the late 1940s, most members of the United Nations were aligned with the United States and shared its views regarding world order. But now a great many of these cannot be counted on to share our view of the original constitutional conception of the UN Charter, and this same majority often opposes the United States on important international questions. Therefore, we, reserve, we must reserve to ourselves the power to determine whether the court has jurisdiction over us in a particular case on the principle that the United States does not accept compulsory jurisdiction over any dispute involving matters essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of the United States as determined by the United States. Uh, in this case, that matter was U.S. actions against Nicaragua, uh, which were condemned by the court as the unlawful use of force. So in brief, uh, the U.N. and the World Court are just fine as long as they do what we tell them to do. Uh, but if they act any differently, they don't do what we tell them to do, uh, then they can get lost. Uh, and the U.S. cannot be expected to grant them any authority. It would be harder to be any more clear about the matter. Uh, and I'm sure you all study this in all your courses, given its importance, and obviously it's all over the press. Uh, but that's a clear statement of the position, a clear statement of a very significant break the break from secret contempt for international order and, world, and law to open brazen contempt, also with the reasons provided. Very compelling reasons. You can understand them. Well, in case you didn't understand them, they were amplified by Secretary of State George Shultz uh, a few months later. Uh, this was in a speech denouncing terrorism, which happened to be delivered at the exact moment of the U.S. terrorist attack against Libya. Uh, that one was justified as officially as self-defense against future attack. Uh, that's a novel interpretation of Article 51 uh, that passed without comment as far as I'm aware. Uh, certainly with the world court case in mind, Schultz explained, I'm quoting, negotiations are a euphemism for capitulation if the shadow of power is not cast across the bargaining table. Uh, he went on to condemn those who advocate utopian legalistic means like outside mediation, the United Nations, and the World Court while ignoring the power element of the equation. Well, uh, those sentiments are not without precedent in modern history. Uh, Pre-World War II period offers a few examples, uh, including the primary illustrations uh, of claimed humanitarian intervention Again, that's something we might want to think about. Uh, well, the, the doctrine that the U.S. is exempt from the regime of international law and international order expressed in the tar Charter, that goes, actually goes back to its earliest days, though it was secret. It was typically in internal documents until the Reagan-Clinton years when it became public. So let's start at the beginning. Uh, this is just a sample, of course. Uh, in 1947, the National Security Council was formed. Uh, its first memorandum, NSC 1 slash 3, if you want to be precise, uh, it called for, it was concerned with Italy, and it called for military intervention in Italy, 
and national mobilization at home, I'm now quoting, in the event the communists obtain domination of the Italian government by legal means, uh, that is if they win an election. Uh, that danger was thwarted by uh, control of food supplies to starving people and other modes of subversion of Italian democracy. Uh, subversion of Italian democracy remained a major CIA project, maybe the major project, uh, into the 1970s. At that point, the record runs dry. The documentary record, which was released by the Pike Committee, runs dry, so we don't know about the later period. Well, that's NSC 1. You know, that's right at the beginning when the international order was in installed. Uh, right away, we're going to violate it in case the wrong people win an election. Then we will use force. Uh, take 1954. It was after what was called the disaster of a diplomatic, internally, uh, internal documents I'm quoting now, the disaster of the uh, diplomatic settlement of the Indochina War, which the U.S. unilaterally refused to accept. Uh, the National Security Council, of course, met right after the disaster, uh, and it called for a broad range of uh, covert, forceful covert actions throughout the region, and even possible attack on China uh, in the event, if thought necessary, in the event of, and I'm now quoting, local communist subversion or rebellion not constituting armed attack. Uh, the, the paragraph explaining all of this was then repeated year after year verbatim in the National Security Council memoranda. Now, why the phrase not constituting armed attack? Well, the reason is very clear. Uh, the UN Charter explicitly permits such means only in the event of armed attack. Okay. Uh, but this is saying in the case of local subversion or rebellion not constituting armed attack, we're going to use force anyway, uh, even up to a war with China if we feel like it. Uh, that's again very clear. Uh, so clear uh, that when these were released in the Pentagon Papers, uh, those of you who have looked at the Pentagon Papers know there's a lot of documents and then there's an analysis by the analysts. Uh, the content is radically falsified in the analysis. Apparently this was too much for the analysts to handle. Uh, and it's sort of disappeared from history. I've never seen a reference to it, though it's extremely significant so significant that's repeated year after year, and a very clear and explicit recognition of the irrelevance of uh, the Charter to uh, the United States. Uh, well, these, uh, um, at the same time, the Joint Chiefs of Staff gave their definition of aggression, uh, which included overt armed attack from within the area of the sovereign states, so that's aggression, armed attack within the area, but it also included aggression other than armed, that is, political warfare or subversion, okay? So an internal revolt uh, or, or unwelcome welcome political developments, they're all examples of aggression, armed attack. Uh, we're therefore entitled to respond to them by force. Uh, well, these guiding principles did begin to receive some public expression in the early 1960s. Uh, so Adlai Stevenson and at the UN uh, declared that in Vietnam, the United States is defending a free people from internal aggression. Kind of interesting idea. Uh, so there's internal aggression going on in Vietnam and we're defending the Vietnamese from that internal aggression. That's what John F. Kennedy called uh, the assault from the inside. Uh, that's at the time when he was escalating from state terror to direct assault from the outside. Uh, the essential point was explained by Dean Acheson, you know who he was, also a prominent Kennedy, senior Kennedy advisor, uh, in 1962. Uh, he was justifying the blockade of Cuba uh, at the uh, American so Society for International Law meetings, and he informed the society uh, that a situation in which our country's power, position, and prestige are involved uh, cannot be treated as a legal issue. So uh, it, we, we therefore are justified in resorting to illegal actions, including violence, which was going on at the time, of course, uh, in the case of uh, where our power, position, and prestige are involved. Again, there are historical precedents. Well, by now, it's unnecessary to discuss the matter, the renunciation of uh, 
any obligations under international law uh, is completely open and also almost entirely unquestioned, which is quite important, even unnoticed you know, in opinion and commentary and general discussion. And that's again something worth thinking about. Well, I say almost entirely unnoticed, not totally unnoticed. So the American Journal of International Law, its editor, two issues back, has an editorial comment entitled, Taking Treaties Less Seriously. Uh, and uh, his, he's concerned by what he calls the alarming exacerbation of Washington's tendency to disregard treaty obligations, including, which means international law. And then he gives a variety of examples, not the ones I would have picked, but his examples. Uh, one example that he picks is the U.S. refusal to pay U.N. dues. Uh, that's in violation of a ruling of the International Court of Justice, an advisory opinion that was requested by the United States in 1962 when the Soviet Union and France were withholding dues uh, and, and the United States uh, considered that a terrible crime and therefore called on the court to issue a judgment, which it did, namely saying, yes, uh, that's in violation of treaty obligations. Uh, no further comment on what's happening now. A second example he gives is the recent kidnapping of a Mexican national, obviously in violation of international law. Another is a Supreme Court ruling that the U.S. is permitted to intercept Haitian refugees on the high seas and forcefully return them to Haiti, plainly in violation of international law and also Article 14 of the Universal Declaration. And here, the editor points out, the court relied on precedents, namely Swiss precedents that had been used to justify barring Jews fleeing from the Holocaust. Doesn't think that's quite right. Uh, the next, another example he gives is uh, U.S. rejection of World Treaty Organization jurisdiction uh, in the case of sanctions against Cuba which have been condemned by every conceivable body, even in this case by the uh, international law uh, body of the usually quite compliant and frightened organization of American states. Uh, another example he gives is the Briard versus Green case, uh, where the Supreme Court rejected an order of the International Court of Justice uh, for a stay of execution of a foreign national who had been deprived of rights uh, under the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations, lawful treaty. Uh, he also points out that there are about 100 foreign nationals on death row right now uh, in similar circumstances. Uh, another example that he mentions, of course, is the ICJ ruling, the World Court ruling on the U.S. versus Nicaragua, uh, where the U.S. Uh, simply uh, withdrew jurisdiction ignored the court orders for termination of the unlawful use of force and the orders to pay reparations. In fact, it later forced Nicaragua to withdraw those claims. Uh, the U.S. even went so far as to veto a Security Council resolution uh, calling on all states to uh, observe international law, mentioning no one, but everyone knew who was intended. Uh, that must be I'm sure that's pretty sure that's the only time that there, of, there was such a veto at the Security Council. Uh, Nicaragua next brought it to the General Assembly uh, where it was passed uh, three, three votes in opposition, U.S., Israel, and El Salvador. Uh, United States brought, uh, Nicaragua brought it again the next year. This time there were only two votes in opposition, the U.S. and Israel, which is kind of like saying that the Ukraine voted with Russia back in the good old days. Uh, that wasn't even reported. It was considered so marginal. In fact, virtually none of this is reported. Uh, and you can judge yourself how it fits into the curriculum. Well, sometimes these uh, actions reach, these issues reach the press. Um, there was a kind of a think piece about it by Judith Miller in the New York Times. She's their specialist on this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the headline was, Security Council relegated to sidelines. Uh, and then she discusses you know, the reasons why for this strange disappearance of the Security Council. Uh, the examples that she's got in mind, of course, is Kosovo. Uh, here, the, the US opposed the uh, wishes, not only of the Council, but of NATO members, other NATO members. Uh, there was a debate 
within NATO about whether whether the declaration calling for bombing uh, should allow the Security Council to use what the Times called the neuralgic word authorize. That is, should the declaration say that the Security Council authorizes the NATO bombing? Uh, the U.S. apparently alone refused, uh, and so, though it did allow the word endorse. So the Security Council allowed to endorse the violent acts that we're going to carry out, but not to authorize them. Uh, in the case of Iraq, uh, Miller says, that by most standard legal interpretations, the Security Council had authorized the bombing of Iraq, which is totally outlandish. Uh, more generally and more interestingly, she quotes a high U.S. official as saying that the U.N. Charter clearly allows, his words, clearly allows us to use force to protect our national interest. That's referring to Article 51, which now allows us to protect our national interest. Uh, that's not novel. At the time of the U.S. invasion of Panama, uh, which there were two Security Council condemnations, both vetoed by the United States, uh, in that case with the help of Britain. Uh, the, uh, 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 the, uh, in, the case of, in the Security Council debate over the invasion of Panama, uh, the U.S. Ambassador, Thomas Pickering, uh, stated that Article 51 uh, permits us to defend our interest, okay? Uh, that means Article 51 allows us to invade Panama to kidnap Noriega. Uh, uh, and that was legitimate self-defense, and presumably the same is true of the trial and sentencing of Noriega for crimes that were real enough, uh, were committed while he was on the CIA payroll almost entirely. Uh, notice that this goes way beyond the Atchison Doctrine that international law is irrelevant. Uh, th with, that was much more honest. It just says, look, it's irrelevant. We do what we want. Uh, this is saying international law authorizes us uh, to do whatever we want. That's a long step forward. I don't know if you can find precedents for that in the pre-war period, maybe. Well, there's no reason, uh, there's no need to look for subtle reasons as to explain the content of the Miller article, why the Security Council is relegated to the sidelines, the reasons are quite simple. The traditional U.S. stand uh, rejecting international law has simply become very open and explicit. So naturally, the Security Council is on the sidelines for exactly the reasons that the uh, State Department legal advisor had explained uh, at the time of the, uh, when the World Court was considering Nicaragua's case. Uh, the world does notice it. Uh, by now, quite a lot. So you take a look at the current issue of foreign affairs. Uh, Samuel Huntington warns Washington that it's treading on dangerous ground. Uh, he points out that Washington is now regarded by much of the world as the single greatest external threat to their societies. Actually, probably the majority of the world, he suggests. Uh, and he anticipates on, uh, you know, realist theory grounds, uh, he anticipates possible attempts to uh, counterbalance what a good part of the world is coming to see as, in his words, a rogue superpower, a rogue state, but in this case, a superpower. Uh, so therefore, there are pragmatic reasons to be a little bit cautious. Uh, pragmatic considerations aside, uh, American citizens might have some other reasons to be concerned about this image and what lies behind it. Well, if we want to be serious about it, about the issues of sovereignty and uh, world order and humanitarian intervention, uh, we at least have to be willing to think about these questions. They don't answer everything, but they are preliminary questions that we have to think about, at least if you want to be serious, not if you want to shout slogans. Uh, and uh, far more important, I uh, have to think about the question that I put to the side, that is the actual record of interventions and the reasons for those interventions, uh, which are often clearly given in very revealing ways in internal planning documents, which are available. Uh, they're given very clearly, and if you look, you'll find that they are radically different from what reaches public discussion. A rather striking example is the case of Guatemala, which is recently in the news, but there's a long series of others. Well, it's perfectly possible to decide to ignore the record and to declare that the United States is so powerful uh, that it just does what it pleases. That's the end of the story. Uh, but that's a possible decision. Make that decision, however, it would be 
uh, appropriate to put aside any hypocrisy, uh, to stop appealing to the high moral ground and the sacred principles of world order uh, uh, to be used highly selectively uh, as weapons against official enemies. Take a drink. Okay. We have um, a couple minutes for questions. For those of you who are new here, we give preference to students at the Ken at Harvard or the Kennedy School. So come up to the microphone and. You know, please say who you are and where you are at the college, and we want to take at least the first few questions from the students here. I would remind everyone of one of the concepts that Professor Chomsky put forward, which is how it's important to cede sovereignty to be part of a community. Well, if you all would cede a little bit of sovereignty, which means keeping your questions short, <laughs> Um, then we can have a more questions from this community and we can have also more time for the professor so please keep your questions short and to the point do we have a student first okay right here thanks for coming my name is Atif Khan I'm from the Kennedy School um, if you could please discuss uh, the foreign policy double standard applied to Israel um, by the U.S., regularly by the U.S., um, particularly contrasting Iraq's attempted occupation of Kuwait with um, Israel's current occupation of Palestine and southern Lebanon. Well, first of all, I think we should be wary about terms like double standard. I mean, I don't believe the United States follows a double standard, uh, nor does any other great power. It follows a single standard. Uh, of service to dominant domestic interests. That's overwhelmingly the case. You know, there are exceptions. Uh, and it looks like a single standard. Uh, and uh, you, you don't have to bring in Israel to see this. Just take Iraq. I mean, during, again, or just repeat, during the period of its worst atrocities, uh, the United States supported Saddam Hussein, uh, a senatorial delegation involving someone you well know even went to uh, Iraq uh, only a few months before the invasion of Kuwait to convey to Saddam uh, the administration's uh, good wishes and so on. Interesting transcript of a discussion that's worth reading. Uh, the, uh, uh, and uh, shortly after uh, the invasion, the U.S. again returned to uh, support for Saddam, stood by, watched quietly while under the eyes of uh, the U.S. Army. Uh, Saddam Hussein crushed uh, the Shiite rebellion in the south, killing huge numbers of people, and then turned to crushing the rebellion in the north. And at that point, there probably was an Israeli interest, at least if you can believe what was said in Israel, though it wasn't reported here as far as I'm aware. Uh, the uh, departing chief of staff in Israel and a pretty broad range of commentators, uh, some of them in the English language press, so therefore every journalist knew about it, uh, came out in favor of Saddam's crushing of the Kurds for geostrategic reasons. This went from doves to hawks. Uh, the reasons were intelligible, namely that an independent uh, Kurdish region, region in northern Iraq would establish territorial contiguity uh, between Syria and Iran, two enemies of Israel and the United States, uh, and therefore uh, the U.S. Sh should not intervene, as it did not. Uh, while the crushing of the Kurds took place. Uh, well, you know, are these double standards? I, I don't think so. You know, I think these are single standards. And the same is true of uh, uh, Israel and Palestine and Lebanon. So it's been, I mean, the, there, there's a thing called the peace process. Uh, well, let's take Lebanon first. Uh, uh, Israel invaded, I mean, start, actually started bombing Lebanon in the early 1970s, but it was an outright invasion in 1978. Uh, very brutal invasion. A lot of people killed, hundreds of thousands of refugees and so on. After that, uh, Israel, Israel was ordered at that time by the Security Council, with the U.S. voting for it, hypocritically, uh, to withdraw uh, immediately and unconditionally from Lebanon. Well, it refused, and it's still refusing. 
Uh, the resolution has no force because the U.S., though it voted for it, in fact, tacitly vetoed it, said you don't have to obey it. Uh, then comes a long story, including the 1982 invasion, uh, an attempt to institute a pro-Israeli government in Lebanon, killed maybe 20,000 Lebanese and Palestinians. The U.S. supported it all the way, uh, vetoed Security Council resolutions, you know, kept the arms going, whole business. It was all fine. Uh, Israel is still in southern Lebanon, uh, carrying out and brutal attacks north of the so-called security zone. It goes on constantly, and the U they're okay because the U.S. supports them. Uh, what about the Palestinians? Well, here there's an interesting story which is virtually undiscussed in the United States, or in fact by now in the world. U.S. power is so extraordinary that the U.S. falsification of the issue uh, has now spread to the entire world. But the record is quite clear. Uh, in, uh, after 1967, there was a an a, there was a proposal for a diplomatic settlement it's called UN 242. Uh, it uh, calls for uh, full peace between Israel and the Arab states in return for full withdrawal. Notice, full withdrawal from the occupied territories, territories that had been conquered. That was U.S. policy, U.S. Uh, very explicit U.S. policy. There had to be full withdrawal except for maybe um, m minor and mutual territorial adjustments. Uh, that was world, there was nothing about the Palestinians in this. Totally rejectionist program. Not a word about the Palestinians except refugee rights. Uh, well, uh, the U.S., Israel refused full withdrawal. The, uh, the, the Arab countries refused full peace, kind of an impasse. The impasse ended at an, at an event which has been literally wiped out of history. You don't even read about it in scholarly books anymore. Uh, in February 1971, uh, President Sadat of Egypt offered to accept uh, the U.S. interpretation of UN 242. In fact, he went even beyond that. He just accepted part of it, the part dealing with Egypt. Didn't even mention the West Bank. You know. But he said, yeah, he'd establish full peace with Israel if uh, Israel withdrew from Egyptian territory. Well, at that point, the U.S. had to decide what to do. And there was an internal debate in the State Department uh, that was won by Henry Kissinger on the, mo on the basis of the most insane comments. I mean, the fact that the profession lets him get away with what he published is astonishing. I won't go through it. But he gave a crazed argument, which is in, pr in print. Uh, uh, saying that the U.S. should, explaining why the U.S. must prefer stalemate, so no negotiations, just force. All right, ever since that time, the U.S. has rejected UN 242. It rejects its own principle of full withdrawal, and it is kept to a position that says uh, that uh, is Israeli withdrawal shall be as Israel and the United States decide. Okay? And that remains true up until today. Uh, it gets worse. In 1976, international opinion shifted. Uh, to uh, um, granting to a non-rejectionist position, that is, granting national rights, accept, acceptance of Israel exactly in the terminology of UN 242, and also national rights for the Palestinians in the territory from which Israel would withdraw. Well, that came to the Security Council, too, in January 1976. It was supported by virtually the entire world, including the Arab states and the PLO. The United States vetoed it. It is also, therefore, vetoed from history. Try, try to find it. Uh, that happened again in 1980, continued to happen in the General Assembly where there's no veto, but you can have votes like 151 to 2 and so on. Uh, and that goes on right until the Gulf War. At the time of the Gulf War, the U.S. was able to establish, it had enough, you know, it was established its power in the region. It was able to ram through its own extreme rejectionist position, which is now called the peace process. Now that shows real power, uh, but there's no double standards. Uh, it's a single standard. Uh, Israel contributes to U.S. power. The Palestinians don't. Period. Thank you. Sergei Kassiano, <clears throat> a career student from Ukraine. Uh, can you um, make some prognosis? Uh, what is you expected to be in future such unbalanced position of United States? Uh, it should uh, lead to appearance of second global power somewhere in Iraq, Iran, or somewhere else, or the uh, world community will appeal uh, America to, call, to follow humanitarian values, and finally, states will go down with the interest of world community. Or um, finally, uh, American leadership 
will shape in some kind of formal uh, domination in the world. Well, I, I wouldn't try to predict this sort of thing, but let me just make one comment. No other states are going to compel the United States to accept humanitarian standards because they don't accept them themselves. Uh, states are not moral agents. I mean, one of the jobs of intellectuals is to pretend the contrary, but it's just not the case. States are instruments of force and violence. People are moral agents, and people can compel their governments sometimes, especially in more democratic governments, to follow more humanitarian values. But other states aren't going to do it, because if they had the power, they would do the same thing or worse. You know? uh, now, with that qualification, uh, it's possible that uh, Professor Huntington's prediction will be correct, and that uh, uh, other concentrations of power will develop countervailing the uh, rogue superpower. I don't know if that will happen or not. Uh, in the case, in the example you mentioned, which is pertinent, something like that is happening. Uh, it, and this is part of the reason for the bombing of Iraq, maybe the main reason, in my opinion. I mean, the presented reasons were so obviously fraudulent that we don't have to discuss them. But that leaves open the question what the real reasons were. And the real reasons may have been something that is going on and that the U.S. must be concerned about, uh, namely that uh, uh, countervailing forces are developing. So there are uh, the Iranian position that there should be a regional security system excluding the great powers, which means the United States and its British puppy dog, uh, that, they, that there's a prevailing position that, uh, uh, that they ought to move towards their own regional arrangements. And that is, in fact, drawing together historic enemies like Saudi Arabia and Iran. Uh, and Egypt and so on. The increasingly visible Israel-Turkish alliance is leading to, is escalating that. And that must be of great concern to the United States because uh, control over the oil producing regions is kind of, you know, the primary element in international affairs. But how this will work out, you know, there's no way of predicting. Uh, and there's no point in predicting because there's one aspect of all of this that's under our control. And that's the one aspect we ought to be thinking about. Namely, what can we do about it? Uh, and if you happen to be privileged and educated and, you know, like we all are, uh, and in the richest and most powerful country in the world, which is quite democratic, there's a lot you can do about it. And that's the question. I think that's the primary question, not predictions about things that are unpredictable. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chomsky, my name is Brian Williams. I'm, I'm not a student at the Kennedy School, but I grew up in Lexington and uh, about a mile from your house. And I, uh, <laughs> so I've long been aware of the role that this school plays in the perpetuation of the governing structures of, of the U.S. and of other nations. Um, my question is two parts. More about that in a minute. Uh, my question is two parts. First, I'm wondering if you might offer us your perspective on the recent uh, apologies of the Clinton administration for its role in the genocide of 200,000 Mayan Indians in Guatemala over the last three decades. Um, and secondly, I'm sure that you are aware, but I'm not sure that most of the students here are aware that the Kennedy School gave Hector Gramayo a full fellowship and um, he graduated with a Master's of Public Administration in 1991 from the Kennedy School. Uh, Gramayo was heavily involved in the strategizing the Guatemala genocide in the 1980s, as, as I'm sure you know. While at the Kennedy School, he made a trip to the School of the Americas, uh, his other U.S. alma mater, um, and uh, delivered the keynote address there. As a student at the School of the Americas, he studied, um, took several courses in counterinsurgency, um, apparently learned his lessons very well. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering, uh, secondly, therefore, if you might join me uh, tonight in publicly asking the Kennedy School to issue a formal apology, since everyone at this point is apologizing for Guatemala, um, for giving... for giving Gromayo a degree and to pledge that it will never again admit torturers and killers to this institution or at least not give them full fellowships. Well, there was, I mean, there was an apology of a sort. I don't think it amounted to anything and I really suggest you look into it. Uh, the apology basically said, yeah, we're sorry we made a mistake and it was all because of the Cold War and we were making a lot of mistakes. Two problems about that. One, it was not a mistake. Uh, it was planned consciously, purposely, well-planned, and furthermore, the same so-called mistake was made everywhere else. 
you don't make the same mistake everywhere at all times. You know, uh, so it's a consistent mistake made throughout Latin America, Southeast Asia. You know, anywhere where things go wrong, uh, then it turns out to be a mistake. Uh, furthermore, it had virtually nothing to do with the Cold War. If you look at the documentary record, you see that the Cold War entered in exactly one way. Uh, the U.S. was intending to overthrow the democratic government of Guatemala because its social programs and were simply too appealing. And that's very explicit in internal intelligence records. When they were uh, 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 moving to overthrow it, uh, the U.S. threatened to attack Guatemala. It then banned arms to Guatemala from other sources, like France, in the hope, which was explicit, that Guatemala would then turn to the Russians for arms, which it did, giving the U.S. Uh, you know, then took the right uh, to uh, institute a blockade because our uh, self-preservation was threatened, was the line, uh, by uh, Russian arms going to Guatemala, which we were visibly intending to attack after all other sources were barred. Yeah, so there was a Cold War element. That was it. Uh, and if you look at the other cases, they come out about, about the same. Uh, so the apology was unreal. It was not a mistake. Uh, it was... Uh, 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 it w had virtually nothing to do with the Cold War, and uh, the U.S. involvement went way beyond what Clinton described. It was very significant. About uh, General Gramajo, you're exactly right. He was one of the leading killers in the early 1980s. He came to the Kennedy School in 1990, I think, or so. Uh, I found out about it. I was actually involved in this indirectly. I found out about it from Central American sources. Uh, Activists here made inquiries. At first, the Kennedy School denied that he was here. You know. uh, the, uh, uh, it turned out he was here. And then a very dramatic and, uh, incident took place, uh, which maybe some of you recall. At the commencement, uh, the Center for Constitutional Rights had arranged to serve a subpoena on Gramajo, who is, in fact, liable under US laws for uh, crimes committed abroad if he happens to be here. That's now Supreme Court has decided that. Uh, Alan Nairn, a very enterprising and imaginative journalist who also exposed a lot of US crimes in Guatemala. Uh, at the moment when uh, Gramajo was walking up to get his degree, uh, raced down the aisle and handed him the subpoena in front of the television cameras. Uh, Gramajo came to trial. He fled the country. Uh, he came to trial, and he was uh, condemned, sentenced in a U.S. court for, I forget how much, I don't know, $14 million. $47 million. What was it? $47 yeah. million, some large sum. Okay, that, uh, that was an important act. Uh, however, the next year, uh, apparently, here you can check, uh, I found out that an Indonesian general was coming here. Uh, there was a massacre in Indonesia, a big massacre in November 1991. And uh, as part of the cover-up, the, the Indonesians made a mistake, tactical error, in case those of you who are going into the diplomatic service or something better learn from these things. Uh, it's wrong to commit a massacre in front of television cameras. <laughs> That's considered a very bad move. And it's particularly wrong to practically kill two American reporters, even if they happen to be dissidents. Uh, and in fact, that's what the Indonesians did. They made two big mistakes. It was in front of a camera, which a hidden camera. They didn't know about that. And, uh, it, and they practically beat to death two American reporters, one of whom was Alan Nairn. Uh, the other was Amy Goodman, who was with him, who you hear on Pacifica if you listen. Uh, well, that's a mistake. After, a, after that kind of mistake comes a certain routine. It's called a, an inquiry. You know? uh, it's a word that means cover-up. Uh, in which you, uh, you absolve yourself of the mistake and maybe punish a few junior officers and so on, and that happened. Everybody applauds this great show of democracy. Uh, but then they wanted to get rid of the people. They wanted to sort of remove the people responsible, and the chief general was General Panjaitan, so they sent him off to Harvard, I think. They certainly sent him <laughs> off to Cambridge. Uh, now, uh, again, personally happened to find out about it from Australian sources in this case and uh, note, you know, told some people around here. And they started, they found him. He was here all right. Uh, and, and they started picketing around his house. Uh, and then came my favorite headline ever in the Boston Globe, uh, which said, Indonesian general flees Boston. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> Whether, whether he was actually at the Kennedy School on Gramajo's program or not, I don't know, because that was never established. But he was certainly doing something in 
Cambridge, uh, and he fled Boston, and he was brought to trial and uh, condemned, and again, some huge fine. I forget what it was. Uh, but uh, yeah, these things happen and they are important. They ought to be brought out. So somebody ought to find out, for example, whether General Panjaitan was at Harvard. Uh, and uh, you can ask the same thing about other issues. So for example, let me just mention one. Uh, when uh, when the, Indonesian, the huge Indonesian massacre that made General Suharto everybody's favorite uh, in 1965, when he came to power killing, I don't know, maybe half a million people or so, mostly landless peasants, uh, the support for that was so overwhelming that it was impossible to suppress. Uh, it was just total euphoria. Actually, I've reviewed it in print if you're interested. And now nobody wants to admit it anymore. It's too embarrassing. But the bloodbath was just celebrated. Uh, and uh, um, internally, not publicly, but internally, the government, U.S. government, took credit for it. So Robert McNamara, who was Secretary of Defense, uh, wrote a letter to President Johnson, secretly, now public, uh, in which he said, uh, uh, yeah, he said we really had a significant role in this, and he particularly praised the training that Indonesian officers were getting at American universities, uh, which sort of, you know, got them get the right ideas in their heads, so they were able to carry out this uh, highly welcome cleansing of the society, uh, which the CIA described as one of the great mass murders of. Uh, the 20th century comparable to Hitler, Stalin, and Mao. Well, according to McNamara, they learned their skills at American universities, maybe. Uh, anyhow, something to think about. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you know, there, there's a microphone oh, I'm sorry. way up there. Is I can't see it. Yeah, way. it's hard to see. Okay. Is there someone standing at the mic up there? No. 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 Then let's go, then let's go right Would you, Could you comment on the... Oh, my name is James Williamson. Uh, I live here in Cambridge. Um, could you comment on the uh, effort to extradite General Pinochet, the uh, decision of the law lords, and the, uh, the claim of purported sovereign immunity for a, uh, a supposed former head of state, and perhaps most interesting and important of all, the U.S. role in all of this and the almost complete absence of any reporting about that in the corporate media in this country. Well, I only saw briefly this morning's paper, so I don't know the details, but apparently the law lords uh, kind of uh, sneaked out of the issue. Uh, they said, yes, uh, Pinochet is liable, but only for crimes committed since 1988, okay, so since the date when Britain decided that torture isn't nice, uh, at least in public, uh, the, uh, uh, which, which basically eliminates the issue. Uh, but they did apparently, I'm almost reading from headlines, so I might be wrong, uh, 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 say that they didn't accept the principle of sovereign immunity. Okay, so that seems to be what they decided. Probably, you know, you'll know more when you look at the details, which I haven't done yet. Uh, on the... Uh, uh, that's essentially a cop-out, you know, uh, because the crimes were overwhelmingly in the early 70s, not after 1988. Uh, as for the U.S. role, I mean, that's decisive. You know, the U.S. was surely played, and it's not even in question uh, since the Church Committee hearings, a decisive role in uh, overthrowing the government, installing the dictatorship, supporting it all the way through, you know, and so on. Hence, in all the crimes that took place, and. Uh, there's plenty of discussion in Latin America asking uh, if, uh, where there's a lot of, you know, uneasiness about the fact that they're going after Pinochet, you know, a weak person from a weak country, not after people from powerful, rich countries. Uh, why not Kissinger, for example? Uh, but the point is, well, before applauding, I think you ought to bear in mind that although that's a fair question, if Kissinger were brought to trial, uh, I don't think this act would enter very heavily. I mean, as compared with other crimes, far more massive than this one, this is kind of like a footnote, bad enough, you know, but uh, not ranking very high among the state crimes in which he himself was decisively involved. Uh, well, those are questions that will never be dealt with by international law unless populations of countries make their own countries do it. Then it can happen, you know, it's not gonna happen by state action. In fact, that's true of the whole human rights regime. Now, where did it come from? 
Um, it was sort of forced, it's called the Carter Human Rights Policy, but that's very misleading. It was really a congressional human rights policy that was forced on the administration, uh, and it worked its way through Congress in large measure because of events of the 60s. Uh, there were young legislative assistants who had been through the ferment of the 60s, your classmates, uh, who worked their way into congressional offices, introduced, uh, got Congress, congressional representatives to push through human rights uh, uh, legislation, which finally forced the administration to do something, forced the courts to do something. That's how things happen. I think we've got time for one last question, and you're it. <laughs> Thanks. My name is Ian Simmons. I'm a student at the college. Uh, I was hoping you could bring our attention back to the question of the role of the university in preparing students for democracy and address the question, what does it mean to educate for democracy? Um, a couple of times this evening you've mentioned sort of superficial intellectual discourse and the roles of universities in um, harboring dictators. I was wondering um, what kinds of things, what is the sort of the missing link within the culture of the university? In other words, what is it within the culture of, say, for example, the Kennedy School and Harvard College that encourages us um, to be either ignorant of or complicit in um, the kind of acts you described this evening? Well, uh, you know, I, I'm sure, I think you're in a much better position to answer that than I am. Uh, although I was here a long time ago, long enough ago to be a patriarch, I heard. Uh, but, uh, the, uh, uh, but look, I mean, I think the basic story is not very subtle. Uh, there's a, I mean, there, there are a lot of very good things that ha can happen at a great university. For one thing, it has fabulous resources, you know, and you can use those resources. And there are plenty of opportunities within the curriculum and outside the curriculum to learn an awful lot from faculty, from fellow students, from Widener Library, you know, International Law Library, and so on. But, you know, you've got to do that. Uh, it's just, it's not going to be handed to you. Uh, and in fact, even in the sciences, you have to do it, certainly in these areas. It doesn't get handed. Uh, uh, why it doesn't happen more readily, not just at Harvard, but at, their counter, at Harvard's counterparts in England and France and Germany and everywhere else in the world, is, is again, not very hard to understand. Uh, elite, the whole elite education people is training uh, for management, uh, economic management, political management, cultural management, social management, and so on. Uh, universities are parasitic institutions. They don't generate their own resources. Uh, they're living off of the concentrated power of the society. I mean, would you really expect uh, uh, concentrated centralized power to be training subversives? You know, to, who will overthrow that power? I mean, the great thing about universities is it gives, is it gives you that opportunity. You know, they're very free, but uh, uh, by, by comparison with the other existing institution, these are very free. Uh, and that's, and this is probably the freest time of your life, you know. Uh, so here's the opportunity to use resources that are available to privileged people to do things that powerful institutions don't want you to do. And it's very understandable why they shouldn't want you to do them. And it doesn't have to be, you know, any kind of an agreement or anything. It's just kind of built in. Actually, what I'd urge you to do is read... Uh, George Orwell's essay on the topic, maybe the most important essay he ever wrote, and maybe the least read. Uh, it's in the Introduction to Animal Farm, which didn't, was not published. Uh, it was discovered in his papers 30 years later. It was on censorship in England. You all know what Animal Farm is. Uh, here he described the way it works in a free country, England. He said it's not a lot different. You know, unpopular ideas are suppressed without any use of force. And one of the, he gave some discussion of how it happened. Uh, one of the me things that he described, just in a few words, but I think you'll all recognize it, is that if you're the beneficiary of a good education, you come to internalize the understanding that there are certain things it just wouldn't do to say, okay, or for that matter, even to think. And if you don't internalize that, you usually get weeded out along the way somewhere. Uh, no, it's not a, you know, like it's not 100%, uh, but it's a pretty powerful system, as he recognized. Uh, and the fact that his uh, essay is unknown is, and was not published is perhaps further evidence for that. <laughs> but, <laughs> thank you. Join me in thank you.
Um, Harvard, there will be an informal discussion for Harvard undergraduates over here in the IOP seminar room. I was told to announce that. Thank you.